This is yours if you Okay. Let's begin. Let me let me have your attention. Let's begin. Uh, welcome to the University of Tennessee Nuclear Engineering Department Colloquium Program. My name is Lee Dodds, and it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, who probably really needs no introduction. As most of you know, Dr. Weinberg was in the Manhattan Project during World War II, which is uh, where he worked with uh, Nobel laureates uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, Eugene Bigner, and others. After uh, the end of World War II, he became the research director for the Clinton Laboratories, which was the predecessor of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, and so he spent most of his career at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, he was actually the laboratory director for almost 20 years. Uh, after he retired in uh, the early 70s, he uh, founded the Oak Ridge Institute for Energy Analysis. Uh, and he headed that organization for another 10 years, and then he retired a second time. Uh, as you'll see today, he's really not retired. Uh, he's here to give us some good information. Uh, uh, he has many, many numerous awards. They're, they're too numerous to, to list and go over here today, but I will tell you that he is one of the few people who is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. So without any further delay, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure for me to uh, present to you Dr. Alvin Weinberg. So you can I don't see myself on the screen. You have to speak. You need to start speaking. No, you can, no, you can go ahead. Dr. Weinberg is going to make a few opening remarks, and then we're going to have a question and answer period. And so, Dr. Weinberg, you can go ahead and make your opening remarks. Well, I should explain that uh, I've been giving the opening lecture in your nuclear energy or nuclear engineering colloquium for, oh, what, about 15 years. And I'm now uh, in my 90th year, uh, according to Chinese style of reckoning, which adds nine months to your age because they argue that you're born when you're conceived. And so I always thought that 90 was sounded more impressive than 89, and so I uh, had a birthday party not too long ago to which my family was invited, and we called it Alvin's 90th birthday. Uh, but I did extract from Lee uh, the promise that who really wants to listen to a 90-year-old relic, and rather than put on a, a set speech, I would be willing to uh, answer questions, make this a Q&A session, and he said, okay, but then he finally got me to agree to say a few words uh, at the beginning of this Q&A session. Uh, where I outlined some of the things that bother me these days. Uh, I have a son who's a neuroscientist at University of North Carolina, and he calls me every night to see how his old daddy is doing. And last night he said, Pop, for goodness sakes, don't talk too long. And I have that predilection of 
uh, I get started and then I keep going. Jack can tell you that because he used to work at this institute that uh, we established. But I began thinking about what were some of the things that I would like to convey to the present generation of young nuclear engineers. And I guess the thing that uh, disappoints me more than any in my young life has been the fact that although nuclear energy has had enormous repercussions, mostly for the benefit of mankind, it is actually on trial still, even though it's 60 years since the first chain reaction was established. I became aware of this many, many years ago when I was listening to Enrico Fermi, who was really the inventor of nuclear energy. And, well, one of the inventors, perhaps. And I remember him telling a seminar that I happened to attend, look, we are creating a new energy source, which is an extraordinary achievement. And we all knew that, of course, even those of us who were not directly involved with the bomb, but were involved with the production of plutonium for the bomb. That's what Chicago uh, was all about. And then he said, but it is not clear to me, he said, that a, an energy source which is encumbered by large amounts of radioactivity and which is further encumbered by the possibility of proliferation of nuclear weapons, something like we're seeing in the newspapers every day today, will be acceptable to the public. And my 60 years, I guess, in this business, uh, I asked myself, what did you do all that time? And I guess it's fair to say that I tried to prove that Fermi was wrong, that despite its shortcomings, which all thoughtful people in the nuclear business concede, the benefits really do outweigh the risks. And I therefore will begin this Q&A session by totting up the benefits and the risks and trying to understand how we got to a point where although 20% of electricity throughout the world is now being produced by nuclear energy, there is still question in many countries as to whether nuclear energy will be deemed acceptable. Well, I am uh, glad to see that uh, a fellow by the name of Ted Rockwell, some of you may know Ted, uh, who was Admiral Rickover's right-hand man during the design and construction of the nuclear ship Nautilus. Uh, Ted Rockwell has organized a group that is trying to restore nuclear to a place of honor rather than a, a place of disgrace. And this is important for the young nuclear engineers who are so efficiently produced here at UT uh, as much as anything because quite apart from nuclear energy as a source of energy or as a weapon, there are 
profoundly important technological uh, <laughs> efforts that are transforming many of the ways in which we do common things in the world. And a fellow by the name of Alan Waltar, W-A-T-H-A-R, you probably know him, Jack. He was the president of the American Nuclear Society. He's written uh, an extraordinary book uh, called Radioactivity in the Modern World. And he tries to make an estimate of uh, how much is added to the gross national product in the United States each year by the use, the widespread use of uh, nuclear technologies, particularly isotopes. And the number that he comes out is extraordinary. He says that of the what shall I say, $10 trillion GNP that we now have, $400 billion of that can be attributed to the use of radioisotopes. Now, you'd think that use of radioisotopes is a very benign kind of thing, but if you talk to people who are in the radioisotope business, they feel that they are on trial also because the same arguments that are used to deny nuclear energy itself, which is, among other things, a waste disposal problem, uh, these same arguments are being used to deny the use of radioisotopes. And old people like Alvin Weinberg, of course, Radioisotopes are what he lives on now. Uh, that's more than a kind of joke because many of the pacemakers that are now used are powered by radioisotopes. And there are many people in the world now who are alive because of pacemakers. And just an example of the many, many, many uses of radioisotopes and uh, non-radioactive isotopes that make up this $400 billion of national income. Well, I guess at the end of my life, I would be excused for having devoted a good deal of time, especially in recent months, to the question, where did we go wrong? Uh, here is a technology that has been, in most cases, mastered, uh, which is benign insofar as electricity is benign. Uh, which has unsolved problems, to be sure, but why did people hit upon this technology to be the target of so much uh, antagonism? And I guess I decided, after thinking about it for 60 years, that the real culprit in this is the acceptance of the idea that radiation is deleterious no matter how small the amount of radiation is. That when people talk about they're scared of the waste disposal system at Yucca Mountain, you ask, what is it that bothers them? And what they always say is, well, it might contaminate the water table. But then in 10,000 years or something like that, or 100,000 years. And then you ask them, well, how much will it contaminate the water table? And they'll give you a figure. Usually they don't really know what the contamination will be. 
But then you ask, well, has there been any demonstrated instance of any person being harmed by contamination of that order? And the answer is, surprisingly, no. Well, then you say, why do people worry so much about radioactive contamination of the biosphere? And the way I realize we should have put it, but we didn't, goes like this, that when you try to estimate the uh, catastrophic consequences of nuclear energy, by far the most important catastrophic consequence is the bomb, and the hydrogen bomb, of course. But when you try to estimate, say, how dangerous Yucca Mountain will be, or for that matter, how dangerous isotopes, which are used in the Oak Ridge Hospital every day, uh, how dangerous those will be, then you come back to the estimates that are based on the I guess you'd have to say heroic analysis of the uh, people who were exposed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what people don't realize generally is that you can uh, estimate the exposures to these people in two classes. One class are people who have actually been harmed by the radiation, or for that matter, mice that have been harmed by radiation. And the fact is that if you use that as a criterion for whether or not there is a threshold for deleterious effect, you would say, well, what we observed is that if the radiation exceeds, let us say, uh, 100 milliroentgens per year, or 1,000 milliroentgens per year, then there will be casualties, and these are demonstrated casualties. But in addition to the demonstrated casualties, there will be what I call phantom casualties, or uh, virtual casualties. And these are casualties that you estimate by assuming that no matter how small the radiation is, that there will be casualties if the number of people that are exposed is sufficiently large. And the Earth now has 6 billion people on it. So if you multiply 6 billion people, by a probability of one over six billion. Well, then you get one. But you have to realize that you are not saying that this is what will actually happen. These are the phantom casualties that we calculate. But they may or may not have anything at all to do with, act with what actually happens. And I think that the health physicists and those of us who were uh, promoters of nuclear energy all our lives, and I'm now talking not only about power, but about uh, isotope technologies, that we goofed in not making it clear to the public that you have to look at the dangers of nuclear energy in two separate boxes. The real dangers, which are exposures at, let's say, 10 rankings per year. And those are demonstrated. People know that uh, by experiment that these are actual casualties. And the virtual are the phantom casualties, which are much larger in number because the number of people that are exposed at very low levels are much, much larger than the number of people that are exposed at, say, uh, 100 rankings or whatever. And I think that uh, 
had we had our senses about us and uh, listened strongly to Enrico Fermi's warning, we would have uh, somehow arranged for our regular regulatory people to look at the question from this point of view, that you divide the casualties into real casualties, which have been demonstrated, and virtual casualties, which are calculated, calculated on the basis of linear hypothesis, no threshold hypothesis, which one has to admit uh, when people use the linear hypothesis in that way, they always preface their remarks by saying, well, this is not really what is going to happen, but it's the closest that we can come to something that might happen. They don't just come out and say, these are virtual casualties as opposed to real casualties. Well, I guess I've already used up my 10 minutes and uh, I'll shut up and take questions and try to answer them. Uh, I know this is a kind of new idea for some of the people in this room. It's been a, it's a new idea for me and I kick myself for not having realized that that was really the way we should have uh, described the risks of nuclear energy. And maybe that would have aborted the uh, problems that you have now in Italy, in Sweden, in Austria, uh, in the Scandinavian countries where they have good running reactors, but they've decided to shut all of them down. And they have shut down the Italian reactors. They shut down one of the 20 reactors, the 12 reactors in Sweden. They've shut down uh, a reactor in Austria simply because people are scared. And I think that we technicians, nuclear technologists, are responsible for scaring the public by not making this distinction between real casualties and phantom casualties. Well, that's a, a statement that's hardly a speech, but maybe it'll evoke some questions and answers. Okay, let's give Dr. Weinberg a round of applause for his comments. Okay, uh, our uh, microphone system may not be sensitive enough to get questions from the back of the room, so I may repeat some of the questions. So the floor is now open for questions for Dr. Weinberg. Now, I have questions here in front of me from cyberspace. Okay, Larry, Dr. Uh, Keller. Yeah, the word did go wrong. Uh, one of the things that I've considered was uh, the choice for the liquid metal reactor, fast reactor, is supposed Excuse to me, how do you uh, increase the volume here? Let me walk through. Okay. Uh, you mentioned where did we go wrong? Uh, and uh, one of the things I noticed you were active in was the molten salt reactor. And instead of that, we went to the liquid metal reactor. Do you think that was a serious mistake? You got to repeat it. Okay. Did you did you hear the question, Dr. Weinberg? I can repeat. Yes, I understand. Okay. Yes, I think it was a mistake, but I guess what I'm talking about is uh, goes much beyond the kind of reactor that we're going to build or that will take over, because no matter what kind of reactor you build, apprehensive members of the public or Ralph Nader, for that matter, uh, will be able to use this confusion between phantom deaths and real deaths to scare people out of nuclear energy. So I don't think, I think that that issue overrides the question of whether molten salt is better than liquid metal. I happen to think that molten salt is better than metal, 
but I can't prove it anywhere. Okay. Uh, as I have a follow-on question from uh, Cyberspace that we got by email right before t today's colloquium, and uh, it's related to Dr. Miller's question. And this question comes from Kirk Sorensen, who is with the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, and it has to do with the molten salt breeder reactor. Uh, he would like for you to comment on the inherent safety of the molten salt reactor and how we might be able to uh, restart a molten salt reactor program. Do you have any suggestions in that regard? Well, the molten salt people, uh, who included uh, the most famous figures in, in nuclear energy, in particular Eugene Wigner, uh, are all dying off. And once they're dead, then I suppose you can uh, reinitiate a program on molten salt. Now, are molten salts inherently safer than liquid metal uh, fuel pin reactors? I think they are as much as anything because uh, you don't have uh, supercritical uh, amounts of uranium involved in the system. Uh, you add uranium bit by bit, bit as you need it because the material is molten. But I'm much impressed with the fact that despite the molten salt reactor having, in a sense, been a failure in that we don't have people building molten salt reactors now. The uh, molten salt reactor experiment, which produced seven and a half megawatts of heat, was one of the most important and, and I must say brilliant achievements of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I hope that after I'm gone, people will look at the dusty books that were written on molten salts and we'll say, hey, these guys had a pretty good idea. Let's go back to it. Okay. Thank you. Next question from the audience. I have other questions here, but okay, Jeff, um, you, come, why don't you come up here and speak with me? Uh, I noticed that you, you, you said that you found the problem, so what suggestions do you have to correct the problem that you found? Yeah, he, he's asking uh, your comments about uh, virtual uh, ca casualties and real casualties. You've identified the problem uh, as to how we went wrong initially, and do you have any suggestions on how to correct the problem now? Well, I think the way you correct it is to say, oops, we made a mistake in lumping virtual casualties together with real casualties and then just have outfits like the Nuclear Engineering Department of the University of Tennessee pick that up and examine uh, the essence of that suggestion. Okay. Other questions from the audience? Dr. Peavy. Uh, Dr. Weinberg, I have a historical question. We haven't dealt in that yet. I uh, I wonder what your uh, perspective was. You were uh, in the late 20s during your, I mean, that was your age when during the Manhattan Project. Uh, we can read in the history books about the uh, progress uh, uh, of the Manhattan Project technically and how different uh, problems arose and were overcome. But what a feel that I cannot get from the historical books is what it was like uh, how much information a person like you had day to day as we uh, attack, as the project attacked these problems, what was it like uh, emotionally or even physically uh, to work on this? Was it exhausting well, work? Well, you have to realize there was a war going on. And I don't think I have worked as hard 
uh, as I did during the Manhattan Project days, uh, after the Manhattan Project. You just didn't realize that there was a war going on. We were misinformed as to what the progress of the Germans were. The Germans goofed, really, and I was one of the people who read the documents that were uh, picked up by the Alsace mission, which went into Germany to find out what was going on there. And I read the documents, and the, the main impression you get was that the Germans just did not have as good nuclear physicists as we did. Fermi and Wigner just weren't matched by anything that the Germans had. And in particular, the Germans did not realize that as far as the slow neutron chain reaction is concerned, the amount of reactivity that you had to play with was given by the delayed neutrons, which is about 1% of the total neutrons that were emitted. And so the German uh, equations for even the slow neutron chain reactor were deficient in that they did not realize that 1% of the neutrons were delayed, which of course makes it possible to run uh, uh, slow operating chain reaction. It's really quite extraordinary that they missed that central point. Now, uh, I suppose you can then speculate that if you don't really realize that uh, only 1% of the neutrons are delayed, that you can, by putting together enough uranium-235 or plutonium, you can override the multiplication given to you by the delayed neutrons. And that's, of course, why a bomb works, because when you put the two pieces together, you are in prompt critical. That means you don't depend anymore on the delayed neutrons. It's just the prompt neutrons. And they're about a thousand times faster than the timetable for the nuclear reactor. So the question, as I understand it, was how do you expect, you know, I guess I've forgotten now what the question was that I was answering. Well, we've got other questions. You, you did a good job answering that one. We have other questions. Dr. Upadhyaya. Uh, Dr. Weinberg, uh, would you please uh, comment on the future of commercial reactors, both in the U.S. and uh, overseas? Did you hear that question? Yeah. Well, my, uh, my prediction about the future of nuclear energy, and I tend to write books about things like that. This is my autobiography, uh, the first nuclear era of the life and times of a technological fixer. That's me, a technological fixer. But the main point that I have suddenly recognized goes like this. I am entering my 90th year. When I was born, my life expectancy was about 60 to 65 years. And what has happened in the intervening 60 years is that the human uh, physical apparatus turns out to last much longer than it had been designed for. And then you look at what's happening to nuclear energy. And it is true that we have, what is it, 102 pressurized water or boiling water reactors in uh, operation in the United States. But the remarkable thing is that every single one of these pressurized water reactors 
as applied for renewal of its operating license, which means that it appears as though the pressurized water reactors are very much like Alvin Weinberg. They're outliving their design basis. And what this means is that nuclear energy, if they can continue uh, renewing the license, the capital costs will go way, way down. And then when maybe 50 years from now, we'll in fact be able to say, yes, nuclear energy is cheap enough to not require metering. You see, the problem with the economics of nuclear energy is its capital cost. It's not its operating cost. That's adequately low. So you have to do something about the capital cost. And the way you do it is by living longer, just as well, being on Medicare, I must admit that it's no great pleasure to think that your uh, repair costs are going to be so so much lower in the future as they turn out to be. But I think that reactors will be different. So I think I think that despite much of the talk about new kinds of reactors. The fact of the matter will be that in the next century, perhaps, we won't build many new kinds of reactors. We'll spend all our time or most of our effort keeping the ones that are built in operation. Because that's a way of attacking the high capital cost of nuclear reactors. I'm rather fond of that observation, by the way. Okay, uh, let me make a comment. Uh, we have another question uh, from cyberspace that uh, I think Dr. Weinberg just answered, but I want to recognize the guy that asked the question. It, it's Paul Stankus from the physics division of, of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and he was asking about genera uh, reactors of the future relative to the reactors of today, and I think Dr. Weinberg has already answered the essence of his question. Okay, do we have... More questions from the audience? If not, I've got some wonderful questions here. Okay, Jimmy. I'll repeat your question. All right. What is it? Right. Right, and that's sort of the question that this guy asked. Uh, Dr. Weinberg, uh, graduate student Jimmy DeGorier, uh, asked, posed the question about if, if, uh, if you think we should be continuing the life extension of existing reactors, should we be putting uh, so much money in the development of new reactors? Maybe we should not do that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that subject? Well, I think that it's unlikely that the newer reactors will be significantly better than the old reactors. Unlikely. Okay. That's, that, uh, that's a good answer. That's an interesting answer. I've got lots of colleagues doing R&D across the country that would probably want to debate you on that issue, but they, we, they're not here today. So do we have other questions? Uh, from the audience. Well, let me say that uh, making sure that the reactors we have will not uh, encounter a serious Achilles heel, that remains a, an important issue. And of course, the Achilles heel that uh, scares most reactor people to death is the corrosion by boron that was observed at Davis Bessey and is now appearing to be endemic in lots of reactors. But there are fixes, and uh, incidentally, it's interesting that the naval reactors uh, had to decide whether they would use boron shimming for their submarines. And uh, 
Ted Rockwell, the fellow that I spoke about earlier, who was Rick Over's right hand man in the matter, he argued violently against using boron, and he won. The naval reactors do not use boron. Okay. Other questions? Uh, then I have, uh, I guess Dr. Peavy and I think along the same line, I have history questions. Uh, we, we, we do technology every day, but history is something we all love. Everybody loves history. And so I, I'm just curious as to how you were recruited to be in the Manhattan Project. Uh, I do know, I think your, your PhD research was in biological physics, which is uh, a long way from chasing neutrons. So can you- Well, not you, really all that far away because nerves are long cylinders and when you analyze them mathematically, you get into Bessel functions and fuel elements in the Hanford reactor are long cylinders. And so you also get involved with the mathematics of Bessel functions. And I was the expert on Bessel functions uh, around Wigner's group during the war. But how did I get uh, recruited? Well, uh, before the war, the American participation in the war started, I, uh, had as one of my advisors on my biophysics work, which involved Bessel functions, uh, one of my supervisors was a fellow by the name of Carl Eckert, E-C-K-A-R-T, who later became the foremost theoretical oceanographer uh, of this century. And he and another fellow by the name of Nicholas Roshevsky uh, set problems for me which involved long cylinders. And Eckhart, it turned out, uh, was on the original uranium committee that was established in 1941 or maybe 1940. And so he was actually a member of the Uranium Committee. And I was working with him on long cylinders. And so he said, huh, you could be helpful on changing the scale of long cylinders so that you have something that has a mean-free mean path about four centimeters instead of four angstroms like happens in a nerve cell. And that's how I got into the business. He said, you work for me half time for six months, at which time we'll show that this whole project is kind of silly. <laughs> if I could put it that way. But that's the attitude that I had for it. Okay. I didn't know any, anything about nuclear physics. Okay. Uh, uh, now that you told us how you got into the, the, the nuclear business, into the Manhattan Project, and uh, you, you eventually wound up into uh, Bigner's group. You were in Bigner's group. What were your day-to-day -day responsibilities in Bigner's group during the I was the keeper of the multiplication constant because, you see, there was a big argument that went on in the early days of the Manhattan Project should you cool the production reactors with helium, which doesn't absorb any neutrons, or with water, which absorbs neutrons. And Wigner staunchly proposed and was almost violent on the subject. He uh, insisted that you could make a reactor cooled with helium, but the materials problems would be insuperable in the time that the war was going on. And he was right about that, but he had therefore to have confidence that adding water to the reactor, which reduced the multiplication constant by about 2%, and without water, the multiplication constant infinite was about 1.08. And with water, 
it would be 1.06, or maybe even lower if you miscalculated it. And so Wigner assigned me the job of designing the lattice spacing and the thickness of the water uh, films that cooled the reactor. So I was Mr. K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like All right. Himself was Mr. K, and of course so was Fermi. Yes. Uh, and and you mentioned Fermi. Okay. Now that we know how you got into the Manhattan Project and what your responsibilities were uh, in Wigner's group, uh, I know there were other members of that group. But how often did Wigner's group and you meet with Enrico Fermi? And, and what were some of your, uh, do you remember your first encounter, or what was your most memorable encounter with Enrico Fermi? Well, I suppose my most memorable encounter was uh, I had calculated what the uh, loss of neutrons would be if you had control rod uh, holes in the reactor. And I mentioned this to Jeremy one day and said, oh, I made the same calculation. What's your answer? And so I said, well, I, this is what the answer is. He said, huh, that agrees with what I computed, except my computation took about this many pages, and his computation took a third of a page. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Have, have you thought of other questions? Because I could go on with... Uh, I have more questions. Dr. Peavy has a question. Since we are talking about people, I'm very interested in Monte Carlo, and I wondered if you had uh, any personal recollection of uh, John von Neumann. Oh, yes. John von Neumann visited Oak Ridge a number of times during the war, and I remember, in fact, I have some film, home film, of John von Neumann uh, joining an outing that we had at Lake Norris. And there he is. Uh, he, he was a gentleman of the old school in a way, and he always wore a coat, even in, in the summer in, at Norris. He uh, was quite interested in the work that was going on at the laboratory on shielding, because much of the work centered around the Monte Carlo method of calculation. Other questions? All right. Uh, I, I do know that uh, Leo Zillard was a real interesting, unusual person. Uh, what can you tell us firsthand about uh, his personality and his contributions to the Manhattan Project? Well, let me tell you an anecdote. Uh, after Zillard was holed up, in the DuPont Plaza Hotel in Washington after a bout with cancer, uh, which finally killed him. Uh, he said to me, uh, come up to my room, I have an important thing to talk to you about. And so he said, what I believe we have to do is to go directly to Christian, was the boss in Russia at the time, and point out that uh, the best scientists in America and the best scientists in Russia will get together to figure out how to live with the bomb. Well, I said, okay, and Szilard took out a sheet of paper and started writing names down of people who he'd invite to this meeting of scientists in Russia. And he put down Robert Oppenheimer, he put down Fermi, he put down Wigner, he uh, put down Sillard, and then he put down Alvin Weinberg. And so I said to him, look here, Leo, and he seldom called Sillard Leo, uh, he called him Sillard. Uh, I'm not a great scientist the way these guys are. And Sillard looked at me and said, well, you're right, 
but you're lovable, and we need somebody lovable out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. He was an extraordinary person. Did not have quite the mathematical power that either Fermi or Wigner had, but he had uh, a marvelous intuition, and he was, in many ways, the inventor of the chain reaction. Okay. Okay. If I finish my 50 minutes. No, no, no. We're not done just yet. Yeah, unless you need to go. We 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 have a few more questions. Can you? Are you okay? Uh, Ten more minutes worth of questions. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. The question uh, comes from one of our graduate students, and he wants to know if you ever had an encounter with uh, Richard Feynman. Oh yes, I had an encounter with Feynman. In fact, I'm in one of his books. Uh, Feynman was a genius. And he was about 18 years old when he joined the Manhattan Project. And he visited uh, several of the sites to find out what was going on. And one of the sites that he visited was the Oak Ridge, no, the Chicago Metallurgical Laboratory. And uh, we show, he said to us, well, do you have any mathematical problems? And I said, well, yeah. We can't evaluate this definite integral. And so Feynman uh, looked at it for a while and said, well, you do it this way, this way, this way, this way. He had a patented Feynman method of evaluating definite integrals. And then he said in his book that he didn't quite put it that way, those stupid Chicago people couldn't do this. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, Bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you know, Ted Welton uh, here in town uh, was Feynman's best friend in Los Alamos. Okay. Well, I didn't know that. Other I questions? Know. I have uh, a question. Well, we, we have another one from Cyberspace. Hang on just a minute. Um, good. This. All right, here's, this one has to do with, uh, uh, well, it comes from a, a fellow by the name of Samuel Orr, who is an undergraduate in chemical engineering at the University of Toronto, okay? So he must be watching. And the question is, were you surprised with the intense physical effects of the atomic bomb when it was tested and or dropped? Was it greater or less than you expected? It was about what was expected, and uh, I knew about the effect of the fission weapon, and before they uh, compartmentalized the work, the work on the hydrogen bomb was conducted, part of it was conducted at Chicago, so I was a little familiar with the hydrogen weapon also. I was told by the people who were working on it what a devilish thing a hydrogen bomb would be. Okay. Um, now, to go back to uh, another question on history, I, I know that you used to be, uh, and you probably still are, an avid tennis player. And uh, General Leslie Groves was also an avid tennis player. He was the military leader of the Manhattan Project, General Leslie Groves. Uh, did you ever have occasion to play tennis with General Groves? No, I did not. I did have occasion to exchange drinks with him at the Waldorf Astoria Men's Bar after he retired. And he told me a very interesting story. Remember that the Hiroshima bomb itself was okayed by Truman. And there was a question, should you drop another bomb? And uh, Groves, who had been drinking a bit, but he could hold his strength, 
uh, said to me, well, you know, the decision to drop the Nagasaki bomb was Groves himself, because by that time uh, Truman had devolved the uh, responsibility lower than the president, which is a, a bit of important history, I guess. Yes, that is important. And I think with that final answer, uh, we need to conclude today's colloquium. But uh, let me tell everybody, most people know this, we do have refreshments downstairs and everyone is invited. But before we adjourn for refreshments, let's express our appreciation again uh, to Dr. Alvin Weinberg for his presentation today. Thank you, sir. Go downstairs. Okay. 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 Okay.